Welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week we travel to the plague-ridden streets of Dunwall in Dishonored. Assassin, help! <laughs> Also off to the post-apocalyptic streets of Tokyo to raise in battles on Pomeranians in Tokyo jungle. Ugh, that just whole concept's been done to death. Oh, if I had a dollar for every time I had to raise and battle Pomeranians, I'd be rich. <laughs> You're a rich lady. And Goose will be reviewing the sequel to Angry Birds Bad Piggies. But first, can you guess the game for this week? <laughs> Who's gonna get ya? I'm -a gonna get ya! Get ya, get ya, get ya! News face, Bajo. That was a good news face. Where are you going? That's not where the news is. The news is over there. It's that way. Good news face. Sustain it. Professional. Good game! High-profile games designer Cliff Blazinski has resigned from Epic Games. Blazinski had worked at Epic since he was a teenager, contributing to many series including Jazz Jackrabbit, Unreal and Gears of War over his 20 years at the studio. For the time being, it appears he will be taking a break from the games industry altogether, with no word on any future roles or projects. Sony is suing actor Jerry Lambert, better known to gamers as PlayStation spokesman Kevin Butler. The lawsuit alleges that Lambert and a car tie company have used the Kevin Butler character to sell products other than PlayStations. Three days after Lambert's contract with Sony expired, he appeared in a commercial for the tire company which promised customers a Nintendo Wii with the purchase of four tires. You know, this is going on your next performance review. Don't make this weird, Jack. The American television network Fox has begun development on a Battlefield Bad Company series. The show will be an hour-long action comedy featuring the four main characters from the game as they leave the military and enter the private sector. Hey, shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Alias and Beverly Hills 90210 writer John Eisendrath has signed on to write the series. How about this song? Mama's little baby love shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby love shortening bread. Several hackers in World of Warcraft used an in-game exploit and level 1 characters to massacre entire regions, killing player characters and NPCs alike. Blizzard responded relatively quickly, applying a hotfix within four hours of the exploit being discovered. The original Carrier Command from 1988 had incredible visuals for its time and also had a great mix of action and strategy. And now the series has been rebooted after all these years as Carrier Command Gale Mission. Our insurrection there was the final chance to free Earth and restore the former glory of a beaten people. As the game starts, you're given a fairly lengthy cutscene explaining how war has broken out between the rebel group known as the United Earth Coalition and the Asian Pacific Alliance, who have already taken over Earth and all its precious water. Everything hinged on who controlled the drinkable water supply. In the end, we were overwhelmed and lost the war on Earth. And now the war has moved to the planet Taurus, where your rebellion is fighting to gain control. And then you're introduced to the main character, who has about as much personality as a cheese sandwich. OK, I see. You need to get back down before the APA tracks opposition, and this whole thing goes pear-shaped. And from that point on, it's very difficult to care about the story and the game, for that matter, because this really is a game where you just get lost in a sea of averageness. The first mission is an FPS section, which feels like it's from an old Xbox game. There's no jump, the graphics are muddy, there's one gun, and enemies go down from just one or two shots. But to be fair, those first-person sections are really only in the game to break up the action, which consists mainly of real-time strategy and vehicle-based combat. Here, you're the commander of a carrier that holds four amphibious tanks known as walruses, as well as four mantas, which are your aerial assault units. You can either sit back and issue them commands from your carrier's map, or jump in and manually take control of any unit at any time. Each mission is more or less the same thing. You take control of an island by hacking into its command centre and securing it. We now have control over the entire island. As you progress, islands offer up more and more resistance, throwing baddies and extra objectives at you, like having to find and take over sub-bases to get access to the main command centre. 
Then, once the island is yours, you can dock your vehicles back in the carrier, head off to the next island in the chain and do it all again. I like the idea of being able to jump into a battle in a strategy game, but the vehicles aren't much fun and the combat is pretty tedious. Yeah, the controls are a bit wonky. I crashed and burned almost instantly when I got into one of those mantises. Once I got the hang of just hovering and strafing, they were a bit more fun. But those walruses were just slow and awkward. Yeah, and the strategy is a bit of a mess. Having just two unit types in an eight vehicle cab is limiting in a strategy game. But what really kills it is the pathfinding of the walruses. They spin around, get stuck, and take forever to get where you've ordered them to go. This makes you want to jump in and take control of one for yourself and tell your AI bunnies to just assist you, but they seem to struggle even more at that. Assist. It's like I'm trying to herd blind, three-legged, ear-infected cats and they just <laughs> won't go where I want to go, and they're driving the vehicles as well. Yeah, and if you just sit back and watch it from the map, it's just... I mean, it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. Mm. Less exciting. Paint drying is not exciting. You can't say that anything's less I've seen some pretty awesome that. paint in my time. That next. is the benchmark expression of, of super boring because watching paint dry is essentially just staring at a wall. I would say the maps are nice and big, but that's actually a drawback since it takes forever to get anywhere with the useless AI. When it all works though and your units behave themselves and do what they're told, there are glimpses of fun. Watching all your craft leave your carrier and storm the beach has a certain epicness to it. I think this game had potential, but they tried to do a bit of everything, but didn't manage to do any of it very well. It doesn't stand out as a strategy game, and the combat isn't impressive. We haven't gone into all the details about how each island has specific types of resource production, or how you can outfit and modify what equipment your units have. It is good that all that stuff is there, but it doesn't help the gameplay fundamentals very much. I think that stuff did work better in the strategy game mode, which is exactly the same as the campaign, but plays more like a, a 4X game. You just get a large open map and go off with your carrier to take over everything. That said, I would hardly recommend this over just about any other decent Forex game out there. Yes, it all feels very undercooked, and it's kind of like we're playing the, the tacked-on campaign to a, a fun multiplayer game, but there's no multiplayer here, so I'm giving it 4 out of 10. I'm giving it 4 as well. Well, just like Bajo is a sidekick to Hex, there have been many gaming sidekicks over the years that have warmed our hearts, but can you name them all? Hey guys, what's up? How you going? Hey, we've got a game for you to review. Oh, look, I... Uh, no, it's not a flight sim, it's okay. But oh. you do need to simulate flying. You'll need these. Thanks. Bad Piggies is the sequel to what is arguably one of the most popular mobile games of all time, Angry Birds, and it sees the henpecked piglets finally getting revenge on their feathered foes. <laughs> the premise of the original Angry Birds couldn't have been simpler. It's a classic tale. Bird is flung from slingshot, bird collides with structure full of pigs. Structure falls down. It's an age-old tale. It was hugely popular because it was so easy to play on the go and the controls were one of the first to be designed specifically for touchscreens. Well, they say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery and over the years there have been many flatterers. Games like Bankrush, Catapult King and even the Aussie made Ballistic, which was by far the <coughs> ballsiest knockoff. Now, after three years, Rovio has released a sequel. Bad Piggies again features short physics-based puzzles, but that's where the similarities to Angry Birds end. This is a much deeper game, as you get to grips with building crazy little vehicles that you'll use to navigate through each level. The game's first half throws a mix of driving and wheelbase puzzles at you, and these look deceptively simple. 
It's when you start to tinker around with these contraptions that the real depth of the game is actually revealed. Adjusting your pig just one spot to the left or to the right is enough to throw off your vehicle's centre of gravity and make the difference between a smooth landing and a horrifying hog crash. Different wheel types handle terrain in their own way, and you'll also get to experiment with an interesting range of propulsion devices. All these pieces can then be unlocked to use in the sandbox mode, with the ultimate goal of collecting assorted stars that are scattered about the terrain. Or you can just do what I did and create disastrous contraptions. Behold, my pig rocket of doom! <laughs> Hmm. Progressing through the 70 or so levels, you'll find that going back to the drawing board becomes second nature. And it's a real testament to the physics engine in Bad Piggies that these multiple retries never really felt that frustrating. No matter how many atrocious attempts I made, I could tell that a successful run was usually just a slight tinker away. It's really satisfying stuff in the end. As well as the driving puzzles, airborne challenges make up most of the second half of the game. And here you'll get to play about with a load of new toys, many of which can be controlled during your run. For example, popping one of your balloons to lose height or maybe firing off a soda bottle for that extra boost requires precise timing and a fair bit of skill. That being said, the difficulty level can spike up very unexpectedly. And passing these levels felt like it required a bit more luck than skill. It was something I found a little bit frustrating, just like in the original Angry Birds. As you'd expect, simply getting to the goal at the end of the level is only half the challenge. Retooling of vehicles and tactics to reach tricky items or beat time limits adds plenty of extra challenge. And as you keep any of the stars that you've already earned, there's no pressure to ace it all in just one run. <laughs> In the end, there's very little to fault with Bad Piggies, really. The vehicle construction may lack some of that accessibility that Angry Birds had, but as a result, it's a much more polished and deeper game, and I actually had a lot of fun with it. So I'm giving it nine rubber chickens. Thanks, Goose. Well, completely original ideas for video games are few and far between, but I think I can safely say I've never played anything quite like Tokyo Jungle. There aren't a lot of games you can compare this to. I guess the closest I could come to would be maybe some weird hybrid of Nintendogs and, and Fallout. It's pretty accurate. It's the future, and humanity has been completely wiped off the face of the planet, leaving animals of all shapes and sizes to reclaim the streets of post-apocalyptic Tokyo. There's two modes you'll be playing through, the story mode and a survival mode. The story follows a few different types of animals on specific missions, eventually revealing how humanity came to disappear. Survival mode is a lot more open-ended. You just have a Pomeranian and a deer to start with, but you can choose whichever animal you want to play out of the ones you've unlocked. And then it's just simply survive. You have this hunger meter that's constantly going down, so you're almost always on the hunt for prey. I'm not normally a fan of timers that count down in a game, but it works here. The best way to hunt is to sneak up in some long grass and go for a one-hit kill. But you can just chase down prey and claw them to death as well. Unless you play as a grazing animal like a deer, in which case you have to constantly run away from everything and hide in long grass. And, of course, find some tasty plant treats to nom on as well when nothing's trying to eat you. We didn't play as grazing animals much. <laughs> there is a decent-sized open world for you to hunt in. It's split up into a bunch of different territories, and in between hunts you'll have to find and mark four spots in a territory to claim it as your own. That means peeing on them. Yes. And once you do that, a nest will appear and some ladies will come around to help you further the generation and carry on the species. And you'll need to do this every 15 years, otherwise they'll just die out. But of course, if you want to attract the best mates, you need to be a strong hunter. Mm. As you eat more and gain calories, you level up from an amateur to a veteran and finally to a boss. Likewise, there are three levels of mate you can attract, desperate 
average, and prime. Just like real life. <laughs> I'm, I'm the desperate one. The better level of mate you can snag, the more bonuses your next generation will get to their stats, and the more members in your pack. Your pack basically acts as extra lives, as well as back up in a fight. If you get taken down or die of starvation, then you'll just take over as another member of your pack. But if your pack gets wiped out, then it's game over. You could potentially play this game forever, but eventually something always gets you. Yeah, and you can't stay in one safe little territory either. You need to branch out and explore because each new generation can't use their parents' nests. I found this game strange, but also strangely compelling. That need to go out and hunt and reproduce just kept me playing. <laughs> And I was devastated when my proud pack of 11th generation Pomeranians were destroyed and wiped out by a group of tigers, bears and cougars. Yeah, you really need to watch out for those bigger animals. I remember at one point I got a bit too bold with my little pack of poms and we tried to take down a horse and was swiftly and brutally kicked to death. We barely scratched the surface of the 80-something animals that can be unlocked. There's tigers, giraffes, hippos and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, Hex. Dinosaurs. <laughs> you also have to find little USB sticks scattered around survival mode to unlock more missions in story mode, and I really didn't like that. I felt like I was being forced to grind through survival just to unlock more of the story. Just unlock the story missions when I finish the story missions. Mm, that was stupid. It's just a small downloadable game, and the graphics certainly reflect its budget, but it's such an original concept as well, and for me, it wins points with that uniqueness. Yeah, and that multiplayer mode was fun, where we were running around as a cat and a beagle, until we tried to take down a tiger. Well, what are you giving it, Hex? Um, I'm giving it seven. I'm giving it seven, too. Now, tiny power! So pick whichever game you want and we'll make it. But don't pick Megan's because it sounds a bit Screw you and your frogs. We're making my game. Okay. Okay, so you either play as Melanie, a 12-year-old girl, <sighs> or as her mother, who, after a messy divorce, <sighs> has, has trouble <sighs> treating Melanie as a daughter <sighs> rather than a friend. I love it. Shut up, Norm. Aaron? Can the 12-year-old girl be a 17-year-old cheerleader? No. Okay, okay. Can the mother be an ex-Navy SEAL? No, she's a social worker. How about a sex worker? No. Will there be any ninja stars? No. Maybe the mother could shoot spectral assassins out of her vagina. Yes! No! Okay, this game is balls. <gasps> there aren't enough stealth games, and I think it is a challenging genre to get right. But Dishonored does. Welcome to the plague-ridden streets of Dunwall. My men were right. You do look like a man out for murder. is not a happy place. The plague not only makes you very sick, but it also turns you crazy enough to shoot bugs out of your mouth. The government has strictly rationed Elixir to combat the disease. We've been on half rations for a week. I ain't catching the plague. Hand it over. No, please, it's for my baby. He needs it. But really, the plague and its victims aren't your main problem. You play Corvo, royal bodyguard, and before you get a chance to even get to know the palace and its people, you're accused of treason and your favourite princess is stolen. What did you do with young Lady Emily, traitor? It's quite an abrupt start to the story, Bajo, and I felt like it didn't quite give you enough time to digest everything that was going on. Yeah, I think that's fair, but things do slowly unravel as you progress, and I like that it's a rescue the princess story. <laughs> but it's also a story about fighting government oppression in a very bad time. Luckily, you're awesome at being an assassin, and when a magical now emo gives you special powers to enhance these abilities, it becomes a very bad time for your enemies. While this is a stealth game, you can go gun ho but if you want to have the best experience possible, you'll want to put this on very hard and focus on being an assassin of the night. Oh, yes. 
This reminded me a lot of the classic Thief series. It doesn't really have the charm of those games, but it's still got very interesting stealth mechanics, especially as it's not really about hiding in the dark. Yeah, Dishonored is more about line of sight and crouching. Oh. Now, Budge, I'm not sure who in video game land decided that crouching was the best stealth mechanic in the world, because in reality it would be a bit stupid. <laughs> Comedy. Your magical abilities are improved by collecting runes, which are hidden around the levels, and some are very difficult to get to. This is ridiculous. While others are just plain out in the open. These abilities allow you to possess animals and even humans, bend time, see guards through walls, and see which way they're facing. There's even a fuss for a dar. But the most used magical ability is Blink, which lets you teleport a short distance and also aids in the parkour system. I do like this movement system, Hex. It is so easy to see just where you're going to go. Yeah, climbing isn't awkward and you're not punished if you aim slightly off where you want to climb to. I thought it was great. But that Blink is just so overpowered. It's such an eye win button to get out of trouble. Spin up the alarm. And I felt like a lot of the really interesting stealth ideas in this game were ruined because you can just blink out of it. Yeah, I mean, it is a very powerful ability and maybe a slower drip feed of abilities would have worked better so that you can earn the right to teleport. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't until I put this on very hard that I started having the experience I was expecting from this game. I think the more you try and hide bodies and move about without getting seen at all, the better time you will have here. In fact, one of the GG team got through this entire game without being seen once or killing a single enemy. And we recently spoke to executive producer on the game, Julian Roby, who talked about these stealth mechanics. That was actually something that we uh, reinforced during development. We wanted to make sure that we can finish the game without killing anybody at all. And there's actually achievements and trophies for that in the game, so if you really want to try to do it. So the way it works is that obviously you can just sneak around all the, the guards and the enemies in the game to try to reach your target, but you still have the objective to uh, get rid of someone in each of the mission most of the time. So the way we, uh, we dealt with that is, uh, so you can either kill them, take them out, or we always give some uh, options to get rid of them without killing them, so basi basically sending them away from the city or stuff like that. And uh, it's always some options that you have to discover by trying to explore a little bit and trying to find those optional ways to, uh, to work around the objective, basically. But yeah, basically, you can finish the full game without killing a single person. I think the options you have are good. There's lots of different ways you can get through an area, and it's quite fun experimenting. There's always a high road and a low road. You can possess a rat and enter by events. Or just go on the offensive. That might be worth checking out. Got you now. There you are. There is a lot of freedom in these zones. They're all quite big, and if you can see something, you can most likely get to it. There's very few invisible walls or inaccessible areas. And when you get busted, it is quite stressful as all those enemies start piling in and you have to make use of all your abilities and gadgets to take them out. I'm also not normally a fan of first-person perspective swordplay, but I think it really worked here. It was very simple, but very tight. Yes. Guns and crossbows worked well too. I like that you didn't have to reload, but you can upgrade things like reload speed and accuracy. I wouldn't call it a particularly gory game, but the kill animations are brutal. I also got a bit of a Bioshock vibe from this at times. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of Half-Life in this game too, especially as you see those striders moving about, and when you hear all those little conversations just happening around you. Some kind of mask, he said. He didn't get a good look. Did he say what he wanted? I hear he didn't say a word, but he went through the place like the outsider himself. It's certainly not a bad looking game, but I had mixed feelings about the visuals, Hex. Yeah, there's a very deliberate and beautiful art style here that almost looks like a, a watercolour or a gouache painting, and you can virtually see the brush strokes. It's beautiful, but it's almost to the game's detriment in the end, because everything ends up looking quite washed out. I tried turning down the brightness and up the brightness, but it, it didn't seem to help. Yeah, I played this on PC, and even with everything on full, I, I still wanted more detail and just a bit more flair to the visuals. The environments and the architecture are beautiful, though. I really liked the, the general feel of the whole world. There's some thoughtful level design too. Most areas have heightened security walls in most zones and your strategy will change depending on triggered alarms or steampunk electricity defences. 
Most situations can be solved with a silent crossbow or sleep arrow, but every now and again you'll come across an organ grinder of sorts who disrupts your magical abilities and this instantly strips you down and things get very intense. And I thought this gave a really decent mix of challenge. Yeah, it got especially difficult towards the end, I thought. Although there were times where I still felt like I was just going through the motions. I think you have more fun if you do a bit of exploring because there are lots of little hidden secret areas and safes with combinations that you can get the code to. Although the loot really isn't worth it, it is just for the experience. Corvo, under other circumstances, I assure you I might welcome your advances. But rats, plague, and tyranny have a way of killing the mood. I think if I'd liked these characters a bit more, I would have been more invested in the story and just more invested in this game overall, but everyone just started to blend together. All those different overseers I had to assassinate. Now about these overseers. Who are just as guilty as my own men, if not more. I didn't enjoy the dialogue. I think if you're gonna go with a really cool theme like this, why not, why not make the dialogue a bit more Shakespearean? Do you think you could protect him? You used to do that, right? Before you had your current profession, before you became an assassin. Oh, the boat rides with Samuel. Of course, if anyone finds out Bro. what to do, the watch will Bro the boat. Swords drawn. Stop talking. And now that you've escaped. Bro the boat, Sam. The Lord Regent's going to be- Stop being boring. Again. Take you up to meet Admiral Havlon. Ah. The Admiral's a man. <laughs> I thought the dialogue was fine. This is a world made up of different times and ideas, and I like the fusion of magic, technology, and ye olde. Welcome home, Lord Protector. Also, your actions will affect the outcome, and there'll be some exciting moments towards the end based on those actions. Unlock me, and I'll buy you a drink in a couple of days. Final thoughts? I think I bought into the hype a little bit with this game, Hex. It didn't quite deliver on what I was expecting. You won't stay hidden for long. But it is still a very well-made game, and anything that gets this close to Thief is good in my book, so I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. In a year of threequels and sequels, it's nice to have a new IP and so well-made. And if you do choose a path of pure stealthy assassin, there's high reward here. I, I had a really good time with it. I'm giving it 8.5. A, a contest of honor will take place. Be it noted that Lord Pendleton's representative has a pistol. Three, two, one. Good game. So what was the game for this week? Did you guess it? It was Whiplash. Released in 04, you played as Spanx the Weasel, tied to Redmond the Rabbit, escaping an animal product testing facility. It was a pretty basic platformer, but it received some criticism at the time for featuring themes of animal cruelty. Next week on the show, Forza takes more of an arcade approach in Forza Horizon. Plus, we get into some deep strategy with XCOM Enemy Unknown. Around the world, of alien ships being blown out of the sky. We'll also take a look at Worms Revolution and War of the Roses. Busy week. Yes, and just as busy over on Spawn Point on ABC3 this weekend with Dragon Ball Connect and Skylanders Giants. As always, thanks for tweeting, tweeters. Till next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Find you out. You know what I should have said? I should have said Forza's shifting gears into more of an yeah. arcade focus. That you could, you could have said it's changing lanes. Yeah, you could have said it's putting the pedal to the metal with yeah. this review. It's, uh, it's... It's Steer, steering, steering in away a different from, direction. In a different direction. You could say it's getting a new paint job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could say it's uh, it's driving somewhere. It's. <laughs> <laughs>